We've been doing a lot of theorizing so far, so it's fair to ask what can all this tell us about actual physiology and adaptations of animals? I'd like to illustrate for you one very powerful example of how this kind of reasoning can help us understand a major evolutionary question, namely the evolution of adaptation to climates. The Scholander model is going to guide us to a novel understanding of this question. We're going to look at a famous so-called biogeographic rule, Bergman's rule, which proposes a positive correlation of body size with respect to latitude and elevation. Specifically, Bergman's rule asserts that body size increases with respect to higher and higher latitude, that is, as one goes from the equatorial and tropical latitudes toward the Arctic and Antarctic latitudes, animals' body sizes will tend to increase. Also, Bergman's rule proposes that body size increases with respect to elevation. Animals that are found at low elevations supposedly will be relatively small in body size, whereas animals that live at higher elevations will be larger. Another of these biogeographic rules is Allen's rule, which says that the relative lengths of appendages, that is the limbs and ears, decreases with respect to latitude and elevation. Specifically, the relative lengths of appendages decreases as one goes from the equatorial and tropical latitudes up towards the Arctic and Antarctic latitudes. And of course, the relative lengths of appendages decreases at higher and higher elevations. It's not hard to come up with examples of both of these rules. Among the antelopes and other ungulates, for example, the tropical ungulate fauna is diverse and ranges to the small in body size, such as the springbok. As you get to higher latitudes, you start running into creatures like these, moose, which are the largest of the deer. It's also not hard to come up with examples of Allen's rule. The classic one is the comparison of the Arctic hare with the desert hare. Arctic hares have shorter and stouter appendages, this is especially evident in the ears, compared to the desert hares, which have relatively long and thin limbs and quite long ears. Now, it's important to emphasize that these biogeographic rules are statistical correlations. As in any statistical correlation, it's not hard to come up with counterexamples. The obvious counterexample, of course, is the elephant, which is the largest extant land animal and which is overwhelmingly tropical in its distribution. Nevertheless, the correlations of Bergman's rule and Allen's rule are strong enough to have convinced scientists that there has to be some kind of evolutionary explanation for them. And the evolutionary explanation has focused on the energetics of temperature regulation. There's a fairly simple and obvious physiological explanation for Bergman's rule. If you look at variation of environmental temperatures with latitude, these trend from warmer to cooler. Conditions are obviously warmer in the equatorial and tropical latitudes and colder in the Arctic and Antarctic latitudes. Similarly, environmental temperatures get colder as you go to higher and higher elevations. We can develop an argument for Bergman's rule using the Scholander model. Here's our plot of metabolic energy cost versus environmental temperature, with the usual landmarks of the basal metabolic rate and the projection to the x-axis at zero energy cost. As we go to higher and higher latitudes or to higher and higher elevations, environmental conditions, as we've said, shift to colder and colder temperatures. And this means that metabolic costs for thermoregulation will increase commensurately. It's a fairly simple leap of logic from there to conclude that animals get larger to offset this increasing metabolic demand for thermoregulation. It's quite simple, really. The less energy you devote to thermoregulation, the more energy you can devote to reproduction. In colder climates, animals that can reduce their metabolic costs for thermoregulation will outcompete animals that cannot. Therefore, we would expect natural selection to drive animals in colder climates to ever larger body sizes. Now, we have to be a little bit skeptical of this simple explanation, though. 
The usual justification for favoring a simple explanation is Occam's razor, the philosophical premise that supposedly tells us that the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. Well, first of all, that's not what William of Ockham actually said. What he said was that one should not spin more complex hypotheses without necessity, which is a quite different proposition from the usual way it's represented. Furthermore, one really should not even expect simplicity in a regime of natural selection, because selection produces any solution that it can. One should therefore expect complexity, not simplicity, to be the product of any regime of natural selection. Occam's razor may in fact be totally invalid for biology, but that's a question for another day. What's missing for right now is a good explanation for why increasing body size should be an effective energy conservation strategy in cold climates. The usual explanation you'll find on this has something to do with the differential scaling of surface area of an animal to its body size. And the argument goes something like this. Surface area scales to the two-thirds power of body mass, while volume scales directly to body mass. The ratio, the surface to volume ratio, therefore declines with increasing body size. The transfer of heat between the body and environment then supposedly gets more difficult as surface to volume ratio declines. Because increasing body size reduces the surface to volume ratio, increasing body size is therefore an effective heat conservation strategy. Now, it doesn't take much to knock this explanation right out of the water. Let's look at the quantities that directly impact energy cost of thermoregulation and see how those scale with body size. If we look at how the basal metabolic rate scales with body size, we see here in blue, we see that it scales to a slope of 0.75. And we already know that the overall energy cost of living is about two and a half times the basal metabolic rate. Thermal conductance, meanwhile, as we've seen, scales to an exponent something a little bit greater than 0.6, shown here in green. Increasing thermal conductance will increase the flow of heat between the body and environment at any environmental temperature below the lower critical temperature. The overall effect of body size in both of these instances is to increase energy cost. Increasing body size means that it will take more energy to sustain life, no matter what the environmental conditions are. And the increasing conductance with body size means that it will cost more to regulate the body temperature at larger and larger body sizes. So this idea that surface to volume ratio is some magic value that's going to conserve heat is exposed as utter nonsense. Getting larger costs more energy, period. In this sense, the conventional explanation for Bergman's rule falls apart completely.